welcome to the Jewish Geography Podcast. This is your host, Rabbi Eitan Levy. I just want to jump on real quick and thank everybody for listening. This is the day for being thankful, right? Or uh, the day before it. It's Wednesday here in Israel. Thursday is Thanksgiving in America, and uh, most of our listeners are in the U.S. I can see that by where people are downloading the podcast. So I just want to say thank you to you. And I want to point out that the name Yehuda, Judah, or therefore Jew, means to praise, to thank. You know, the the way the different tribes work out is a little bit complicated. I'm from the tribe of Levi, and one thing that a lot of people get confused about is how many tribes there are. There are 12 sons of Israel. However, there are actually 13 tribes, right? There's no tribe of Joseph. Joseph, in sort of thanks for having saved the family and provided for them in Egypt, Jacob grandfathers in, literally, his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, and they become as if they're from the generation of his sons. They each become a tribe. So there are 13 tribes. However, the tribe of Levi, that I belong to, does not get a portion in the land of Israel, and therefore there are 12 tribal territories. Now, why am I talking about this? Well, in the land of Israel, it was divided up into 12 tribal territories with Levi scattered around them. Now, 10 of those 13 tribes were eventually broken off from the kingdom of Judah into a separate kingdom called Israel. After Solomon died... After King Solomon died, uh, had built the temple, he served for 40 years, and then he, as king, and he died. And then the kingdom split north and south. The 10 northern tribes, led mostly by Ephraim, they broke away and became Israel to the north. And the southern kingdoms, Judah and Benjamin, and with Levites scattered throughout, became the southern kingdom of Judah. All of the Jews in Judah survived longer, all of the Israelites in Judah survived the Assyrian conquest, and several hundred years later were only then conquered by the Babylonians and were only in exile for 70 years. They survived and they came back, whereas the 10 northern tribes were taken 150 or so years earlier and disappeared into the Far East. And we have, according to our tradition, that when the Messiah comes, they'll be revealed to us and they will come Uh, back to the land of Israel, and some might say that that process has already started. But in any case, what we get is that all the Jews, all the Israelites, the sons of Israel who survived were ones who lived in the tribal territory of Judah. And thus, when Jews were exiled by the Babylonians and found themselves in different places, other people would refer to them as Jews whether they were from the tribe of Judah or not. Thus, I, a Levite, can be referred to as a Jew, and probably scattered remnants of the other tribes who made their way down to Judah are also referred to as Jews. And that's how we get to be named that. But I don't think it's a happenstance that the name of the tribe by which the entire Jewish people, the entire people of Israel have come to be known regardless of accuracy in terms of tribal affiliation, is the term for thankfulness. Because I really think that Judaism, Torah, is at its core, and one, or at least, let's see, one of its core themes with many practices around it is to develop and sanctify thankfulness. We take moments to be thankful for our food when we eat. We, we say blessings after going to the bathroom to express thankfulness for you know, everything working right the way it's supposed to, our heart beating. In the morning, we say thank you to God for waking us up and giving us our souls back that we, we consider spiritually have sort of been away from our bodies during sleep. Really acknowledging a higher power, one of the great benefits of that is there is someone to whom to be thankful. You know, there is there is the ability to be thankful for every little thing. You know, the great the the poets, uh, the great sort of naturalistic poets, and you know English poets speaking about the countryside and um, various uh, American poets, Walt Whitman and, and others. 
they speak glowingly about nature and how beautiful and wonderful it is. And there is a sort of gratefulness expressed in those, in those places, but they really lack something critical, which is they lack an object. They lack a to whom to be thankful. And belief in God gives you that. It gives you an object uh, for your thankfulness. Or I might say even regardless of belief, using the language of speaking of God can give one an object to whom to direct their gratefulness. And the mere practice of expressing that gratefulness really, I think, is, is one of the greatest things in life that can, can help make this world full of trouble and difficulties not only bearable but enjoyable. And uh, I really, thank God, uh, try to bring that practice into my everyday life. So I want to thank God for everything I have, for this technology, for the recording, for the internet, for everything, for you, the listeners, for the clean water I have to drink and the electric heating I have to warm me and the computer technology I have at my at hand for my wife and my family and again for you my listeners thank you so much for listening I hope you have a a good Thanksgiving Hodu Lashem Kitov praise the Lord for he is good Rabbi Moshe Chaim Luzato, the Ramchal, was born in Padua, Italy in 1707, and he died in Akko on May 16th, 1746. Now, for our purposes, he's important because he wrote a series of books which have essentially become staples of Jewish learning and really the cornerstone of what we might call Musar which is a sort of Jewish ethics, is how it's often translated. But I think that calling him a, a moralist is uh, missing the point. Musal is not really simply morality. Musal is a system of thought and a way, a path for perfecting one's character in every conceivable way. And so I thought that I might do a little section uh, of the Mesilat Yesharim, the path of the just, or the, the straight path. His main book of, uh, of Jewish thought uh, and ethics, I should say, that he put together. And this is going to be the first of those lectures. And hopefully uh, I will pull out from, from these words a, a simple message that is timely and relevant and that you'll find interesting. So let's jump right in. In the beginning of Mesilat Sharim, the Ramchal opens with a bit of an essay where he is talking about the topic that he's going to go into. And this is the English translation on safaria.org. The writer says, I have composed this work not to teach people what they do not know, but to remind them of what they already know and which is very familiar to them. For you will find in most of my words only things which most people already know and do not have any doubt about. Which is a fascinating way to open a book, right? He tells you, I'm not, there's nothing in this book you don't know already. In his case, that's only if you're, you know, if you're an Orthodox Jew, you know these things because you've learned them, supposedly. Uh, although I would say uh, many Orthodox school kids don't necessarily learn these things. But in theory, they should have. Or the air should be so thick with that, these these basic ideas that people should know them without even having to to verbalize them. But he points out something very very difficult, which is that all of us, no matter how our principles might be, if we take them for granted and we keep them uh, as something which is not necessarily requiring of work both to clarify and to understand what we believe, but then also to daily bring about the realization of those principles in our lives, then it is very, very easy for us to 
lose sight of them. I think uh, one way that the all the sex scandals that are being revealed right now uh, post Harvey Weinstein is a good example of uh, many people who who clearly may have had good ideas, but uh, or you know in theory had expressed you know ex- respect for women or whatnot. And uh, in fact, I would bet that most of them genuinely believed those statements, but without putting into daily practice in a concrete way one's ideals, it's very easy for anyone, anyone, to fall uh, and to go down the wrong path. And that's one of the brilliant things about the way Judaism is structured, that we don't take for granted that all one needs to do to live up to their ideals is to have them. In fact, we take it for granted that simply having ideals is not enough and that people do not live up to them, generally speaking, unless they have practical day-to-day, moment-by-moment guides to living those principles. In the case of sexual morality, those laws would be laws which have to do with not uh, with men and women who aren't related and aren't married, uh, not touching each other at all. So there's no chance for confusion or mixed messages. And uh, also yichud, the laws of, of being secluded alone together, where, again, men and women who are not closely related and not married to each other are not allowed to be alone in a room. Uh, this would probably solve many of the uh, problems that we're seeing uh, revealed today if everyone followed these rules. Because if the default in a society is that you're not alone in a room together, it is therefore normal and natural for a person, even if uh, the other side wants to be secluded with you, to recall this law and to therefore uh, force uh, the situation that you not be left alone with that person. There's nothing that's 100%. People can always find a way to sin and to do bad things if they want to. But safeguards put in place which help remind people, not only give people opportunities and safeguards, but also remind them of their own principles, which they themselves, when they stop and think about it, they believe in them. You know, there are stories about um, Nazi, uh, not to compare these two issues, because I don't think there's any comparison between the um, uh, these types of uh, sexual harassment and and murdering millions of people, uh, except they're both bad things, but in very different places on a spectrum. Many of the Nazi SS officers who went and killed tens of thousands of Jews were perfectly kind people in their home lives. They were nice to their wife and kids. They were gentle. Uh, there's even a story of an SS officer. I forget where I where I read this, but there was even a story of an SS officer who had actually saved a neighboring Jewish family and helped them get on uh, across the border, I think, to France uh, at the beginning of of uh, the anti-Jewish laws. And he himself killed hundreds, perhaps thousands of Jews when he went to the east because he was removed from his home. He was removed from the normal structures of his society. And under those circumstances, under the circumstances not only of war, but of war in a foreign territory, which is extremely um, easy to dissociate uh, from one's normal life and one's normal moral code, he was able to do those horrible things. And when we live inside a binding structure of morality, which we often may chafe against and which can only be changed slowly, sometimes too slowly. And with a lot of thinking twice and three times and four times and then seeing how small changes go over long periods of time, when we live within those bounds, uh, I do believe that it helps prevent, uh, it can help prevent many of the worst occurrences. Of course, what we saw in the 1960s and 70s was a great loosening of many of these moral codes often for the better in the sense that, uh, you know, women are now able to be, you know, financially independent. They're more free to speak up. And if we can manage to figure out a way to combine that with the structures of traditional sexual morality so that it's not simply a moral free-for-all, I think humanity will have progressed greatly. But as of now, it seems that uh, essentially anarchy uh, in these areas has ruled the day and we're fighting to gain back some sort of order. But 
that's neither here nor there. So back to the text, paragraph two, but according to their familiarity and to the extent that their truth is evident to all, that is these concepts that people believe in but don't necessarily stay aware of, so too is their neglect very prevalent and forgetfulness of them very great. He's saying the more you think everyone believes something, you all know it, you take it for granted, it's, it's an entomeme in, in Greek, as my, uh, my teacher in college, Elfie Raymond, would have said. It's an underlying meme. It's an underlying assumption that we have that is never made explicit. Therefore, the benefit to be gleaned from this book is not from a single reading, for it is possible that the reader will learn little that he did not already know. Rather, the benefit derived from this book comes from review and diligent study, for then he will be reminded of these things which, by nature, people tend to forget, and he will put to heart his duties which he hides from. So by repeating, repeatedly learning through this book, one will make sure to keep his most important principles. And basically this book is a summary of those important principles and character traits that, one, that a, a believing Jew is supposed to try to live up to. By f repeating it all the time, one keeps these thoughts forefront in his thoughts, and therefore these principles come to mind in our day-to-day -day lives and situations, and we can apply them daily. That's, this is me commenting, not, not quoting. So now we begin paragraph three. If you reflect on the current state of affairs in most of the world— you will see most people of quick intelligence and sharp mentality devote most of their thought and interest in the subtleties of wisdom and the depths of analysis, every man according to his intellectual tendency and natural desire. He's speaking already 300 years ago, right? But he's talking, he could easily be talking about today. Most people who are smart and, and driven and, uh, things come easily, easily to them, right? Most people like that are devoting most of their intellectual power to professional things, to um, the subtleties of wisdom, even if you want to put that in terms of uh, law codes or philosophy, academia, and the depths of analysis, you know, analyzing the, the num analyzing numbers, mathematics, etc. Every man according to his intellectual tendency and natural desire, according to what is most interesting and fun for him, or her, and that comes more naturally to them and that they're good at, that is where they go. Paragraph four, there are those who toil greatly in studying the creation and nature. Others devote all their study to astronomy and mathematics or to the arts. There are others which enter closer towards the sacred, namely the study of the Holy Torah. Among those, some occupy themselves with halakhic analysis, others with midrash, others with law decisions. But few are those which devote thought and study to the matter of perfection of divine service. Divine service being life, right? The, the point of everything is how a human being, if you believe in God and you believe that God gave the Torah, the main point of our existence in this world is to serve him. Going back to, to the text on love, fear, clinging, and the other branches of piety. People don't spend as much time on these things as they should. Even people who sit and learn in the yeshiva all day and are supposedly learning God's ways, these things are taken for granted as things that people all believe and share in that environment and therefore are not worthy of wasting one's time on going over. He says, this is not because they do not consider these things as fundamental, for if you ask them, each one will answer you that this is of utmost importance and that it is unimaginable for one to be considered truly wise if he has not fully comprehended these matters. Rather, their lack of devoting more attention to it stems from its be being so familiar and so evident to them that they see no need for spending much time on it. Consequently, this study and the reading of books of this sort is left to people of not so keen, almost dull intelligence. These types of people you will find diligent in all this, not budging from it until the situation has reached the point that if one sees a person engaging in piety, he cannot help but suspect him of belonging to those of dull intelligence. 
So this is my last point that I want to get to here, which is that there's a sort of dullard, uh, I think, that people associate with this kind of what one might call moralizing and harping on moral principles, which, come on, you know, we're all smart, uh, intelligent, um, worldly people who have seen lots of things and made decisions in our lives. We know what we're doing. But the truth is that we're not. <laughs> we, we don't know what we're doing. Uh, and most of us, most of the time, haven't really dev devoted much thought to these matters. We may have adopted a certain system of thinking about it one, at one point in our lives, either more consciously or less consciously from, from uh, less consciously from those around us or more consciously by choosing it. But really, how often do we go back and examine those first principles? How often do we examine how well we're living up to those basic principles? Not, the, not necessarily the, the, everyday, um, the everyday little things like, you know, did I pray three times a day today? Did I say all my blessings? Did I do blah, blah, blah? But am I living up to bringing divine knowledge into the world? Am I doing, am I living up to the reason that I do all these things, the reason that I adopt this lifestyle, the reason that I follow these principles? Am I really living up to that today? And what about yesterday? And what about tomorrow? And there's a sort of hyper-focus, which I think especially today, uh, not necessarily hyper-focus, there's a certain belittling of people who put a high focus on these issues. Uh, you know, one example uh, might be uh, the media reaction to uh, the vice president, Mike Pence. He has a, a principle where he doesn't have uh, dinners out with female alone with, with female uh, employees or, or whatever other people that he works with, anyone other than his wife, which for me uh, as an Orthodox Jew seems like a pretty common sense uh, rule, but for uh, expressing it, uh, he's basically ridiculed and think what you might of him in terms of uh, conservatism and, and liberalism and Democrats and Republicans. Uh, this is not uh, something he should be uh, criticized for certainly, given the current the current situation going on in uh, American life, where the boundaries around sexuality, particularly of powerful men, are being so uh, deeply and powerfully disturbed and discredited. So uh, I think that uh, he's pointing out something. Uh, which is very true for many of us, even those of us within Orthodox Jewish circles, where often learning of these sorts of things can be poo-pooed as uh, less interesting and of a less high level uh, in terms of learning uh, than you know pure halachic learning or you know learning the Gemara and various things like that. But really, this is this the essence of what we're doing in the world, and without going over it, without viewing it. Repeatedly, we're not really going to be able to live up to those principles because they're not kept forefront in our minds. So I want to give everybody a blessing that we may be aware and live up to our own highest principles in life, that we can find ways of bringing the divine reality we strive for into our lives practically. And I want to wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you for listening to the Jewish Geography Podcast. If you like the podcast, please subscribe, please share. And if you really like it and you would like to hear more of it, if uh, you'd like to hear me put out a podcast every week, uh, which I, uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able last week. If you'd like to hear a podcast every week, please go to my Patreon page, p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash Rabbi Eitan. And give a donation, a dollar a month, five dollars a month, thirty dollars a month, whatever you can afford would be wonderful. Any amount is greatly appreciated. And uh, we're still working up towards that uh, initial goal of five hundred dollars a month, and which I'll be able to commit to putting out a full podcast every week. Thank you very much for listening all the way to the end. Have a great Thanksgiving.